everyone. This is Mariana Gatto, Director of the Italian American Museum of Los Angeles. And on behalf of our board of directors and staff, thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, as many of you know, on March 5th, 2020, approximately two weeks before stay-at-home orders were issued in California, the Italian American Museum of Los Angeles opened a new temporary exhibition, St. Joseph's Tables, Expressions of Devotion, Charity, and Abundance. The exhibition explores the cultural religious tradition of St. Joseph's Tables, which are among the richest expressions of Italian American cultural identity, as well as a living tradition that is embraced by diverse cult communities across the nation. Tonight, our guest is Dr. Luisa del Giudice, who will be presenting a lecture that explores St. Joseph's Tables within their historical Sicilian and local diasporic contexts and examines the tradition's evolving meanings. Before we get started, I'd like to share a little bit about Luisa del Giudice. Luisa is a Los Angeles-based independent scholar who previously taught at UCLA, was a visiting professor at Addis Ababa University, and in 1994, founded the Italian Oral History Institute. She has published and lectures on Italian and Italian diaspora ethnology and folklore and has produced many public programs. In 2008, she was named an honorary fellow of the American Folklore Society and was knighted by the Italian Republic. Her publications include Sabato Rodia's Towers in Watts, Art, Migration and Development, as well as On Second Thought, Learned Women Reflect on Profession, Community and Purpose and the forthcoming Triangulations Within the Italy, Canada, U.S. Borderlands. Join us in welcoming Luisa del Giudice. Thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you, uh, Mariana Gatto and Francesca Guerini for curating uh, that exhibition at the museum and also for all the work that you do at the Italian American Museum. And especially for this opportunity out there to speak to you out there in the great uh, internet void, this is my first time, on a topic that I've been studying and presenting all over the world, including uh, Ethiopia and China for over three decades. Let me share my screen with you. I hope you will all agree that this tradition is truly compelling. First, I'll tell you what St. Joseph's Tables are and what they might mean. And second, why and how my thinking about them has evolved, especially in my own work as a social activist. So in the late 1980s, I began as the typical academic, observing, documenting, publishing, presenting at conferences, but then I too uh, made a table, first to bring this hidden Italian culture in Los Angeles to the mainstream. And then I made another to advocate for urgent peace and justice issues, specifically in Watts, but also for places like Watts. This is where Sicily is in case you don't know. Um, I first encountered the Sicilian altar tradition uh, while surveying the it Italian folk life in Los Angeles for the city's cultural affairs department. I wanted to know, because the Italians were fairly invisible in this city, they wanted to know where they were, their social and ceremonial life, their associations, their foodways, uh, restaurants, markets, traditional arts, games, and so forth. We created, with the Italian Oral History Institute, which I founded and directed for about a decade, uh, this website, and we revised it um, there afterwards, but we didn't keep it up, so it's now just an archived website. That's when I met the fiercely Sicilian-American Virginia Buscemi Carlson, who said, without our traditions, there would be nothing left. I learned a lot from Virginia, who has since passed away, and from Sam Pericone at St. Joseph's Church in East LA. And the two of them 
were putting on a St. Joseph's table at that church. And I have to say that that was an excellent beginning for my own research, field research and archival research. So what is a St. Joseph's table? St. Joseph's feast day uh, is March 19th, which is also Italy's Father's Day, by the way. And tables in his honor include a devotional altar with a statue or image rising from or separate from a table. Here are some tables. And these tables are blessed by a priest. And here we have Father Pisano, laden with elaborate food displays of large traditional braided breads, cross and crown for Christ, palm for Mary, a wayfarer's crook for St. Joseph, the implements of Christ's passion, but also many other fanciful shapes. We also have raw fried and stuffed vegetables of, of every sort. Here we have cardoons with which Sicilians eat. They're, it's not celery, it's cardoons. And every sort, the, from cardoons and cauliflower, artichokes, zucchini, eggplant, fennel, peppers, and omelets, frittate. And of course, we have fish. Why do we have fish? Because this festivity falls within the meatless season of Lent. It is a period of fasting. And fruits, the season's finest fresh and first fruits, primizie, in baskets or arrangements like cornucopias of plenty. Prickly pears, fennel and fave, and of course, sweets, lots and lots of sweets, such as persiche, cream-filled pastries made to look like peaches, casadini, sfinci, fig cookies, cannoli, and now increasingly, inscribed commercial baker's cakes. Often these were taken at Casa Italiana. And here we have one Saint Society um, greeting the other, Saint Joseph's, well wishing. Sicilians have quite a sweet tooth with a long tradition of artistic confections, ritual cakes and cookies, and a genius for creating faux fruit with marzipan or almond paste, such as these cherries. And this is known as frutta di martorana, jellied candies, and all kinds of figures in sugar and dough for Christmas and Easter. Here we have some Christmas, uh, sorry, Easter wreaths with the eggs inside. and also uh, Bones of the Dead for All Souls Day, or the Eyes of St. Lucy for her feast day. I want to hear uh, acknowledge some of the Sicilian sources I've used in my study. What can we say about the ritual performance or the pageant in this celebration? I have a special interest in this part of the tradition because I think it helps us understand its appeal to immigrants. Back in Sicily, three of the poorest in the village, including orphans, were dressed as Mary, a young girl, Joseph, an old man with a long white beard, although here he's a young man, and Jesus, a small child, known as Isanti, or the saints, as they were called. And they reenacted the Holy Family's flight into Egypt, as refugees escaping danger, if we remember Herod's decree of the execution of all firstborns. This ritual requires the family to knock on three doors. This is known as the tupa tupa or knock knock. Uh, they are turned away twice and then finally find shelter and food at the home of the family giving the table. It's very similar to the Mexican nativity tradition of Las Posadas, although that takes place at Christmas. So they are seated, the Santi, 
are seated directly at the table and served every dish. Back, okay, uh, and then after that, there is a communal banquet where typically a poor man's meal, uh, either bean soup, pasta ceci, uh, pasta with sardines or couscous, depending on which part of Sicily we're talking about, as well as bread and fruit is served. This is important. No one is turned away. In Sicily, often an olive branch or a palm frond over the door meant that a family had opened its doors to the community. Guests are sent home with blessed foods, citrus, bread rolls, and often fava beans. Uh, and in the US, uh, in the South, in New Orleans, I've heard that they are sometimes called lucky beans, uh, used to keep away storms or hunger. By the way, did you know that if you need to sell a house or buy a house, you buy a small statue of St. Joseph turn him upside down and bury him in the yard. Uh, and this is still apparently done as one friend who is a professional real estate agent uh, recently confirmed. So why would someone prepare such a table? Most were, and some continue to be, private devotional tables, uh, a vow, usually a woman's vow, made to the saint as a special prayer such as the vacados for their daughter, or as a thank you for a prayer which has been answered, per grazia ricevuta, or for graces received. For example, a child cured, or sons returning from war unharmed, or a husband surviving a serious accident. Or they can be made uh, to celebrate one's namesake, such as Joe Joseph Tambay has done. Or as a general Sicilian Thanksgiving, here we have Virginia again. And if you notice behind her, there's a banner for Arba Sicula, Sicilian Dawn in the background. In fact, the founding legend tells that the first altar in Sicily was made in answer to the people's deliverance from famine. Uh, the error with that is insisting that it was in the Middle Ages. We don't really have a record that tables were made that far back. Today, they are almost exclusively public events, but Sicilians are still at their core, while friends, neighbors, parishioners, and businesses make donations of food or money, sometimes pinned directly to a sash in front of the saints. The ritual begging of food, the humbling of oneself before friends, family, and even strangers, it's sort of an empathic reenactment of poverty. And according to Virginia, it's a necessary aspect of giving a table and should not be de delegated. That is, whoever is giving a table needs to know what it feels in their own body to beg for food just as the poor, um, you know, how many poor um, migrants did do this? How many of them did have to wander and still do, knocking on doors in search of food and shelter? In Italy, uh, in Sicily, in previous times, it would have been done barefoot through the village. I mean, really humbling oneself. And I'm wondering whether this could be one of the reasons that wayfaring Joseph with his staff was particularly attractive to migrants. One of the most complete celebrations occurs at Mary Star of the Sea Church in San Pedro, which is LA's port city. And the church of um, the ex-fishing community from two Italian islands, Ischia and Sicily, although there are also Croat fishermen uh, families there as well. The St. Joseph Society, since 1973, has put on a feast each year, now coordinated by uh, Rosalia Orlando, and a few of the original group are still with us, such as Rosaria Lo Grande with her friend Nicolina Orlando. 
It includes a mass and a procession with the saint. Um, and here we have Vita Cracciolo, now deceased, who would rally the devoted with the traditional cry of Evviva Gesù Maria Giuseppe, viva! Her grandson, though, has stepped up and is involved in the festivities. Here uh, is the procession around the church, and it includes children in costumes, a marching band, guilds and societies, quite diverse today, not just Italian. And it ends in a large banquet. These particular photos were taken last year, 2019, because there wasn't one in 2020. And uh, here we also get fruits of the sea. So fried calamari, which are making me hungry right now. So I really want to thank uh, the Italians from San Pedro, Mary Star of the Sea Church for welcoming me over the years and for helping me with my research. Now we turn to part two of this lecture and the evolving uses and meanings of the tradition. So as a scholar of oral history and oral culture, I have been engaged in acts of remembering for decades, documenting and presenting Italian regional, peasant and diaspora culture and history on a great variety of topics, folk songs, dance, food, belief, art, myth, but I'm rarely content to stop there. I instead try to help put those folk songs and stories and traditions back in circulation, hoping that new generations might reclaim and carry them forth. This is the work of what we call public fol folklorists. And if you're interested in this, I check out the American Folklore Society um, website. Transmission and vitality depends on the role of each generation. And our San Pedro friends know this. Their tradition is so vital and successful because it includes children. This ritual of radical hospitality really spoke to my heart, although this tradition is not my own and I'm not even Sicilian. But in 1998, I co-curated with Virginia and the Sicilian community an altar and table at UCLA's Arm and Hammer Museum. Here are a couple of images from our table. Uh, this salmon was baked by uh, Chef Celestino Drago, restaurant, famous restaurateur here in Los Angeles. And women of the St. Joseph Society came to sing novenas. And this, um, our table was right next to the exhibition, The Invisible Made Visible, Angels from the Vatican. Well, I was hoping to make our invisible local tradition invisible too, and oral historians love to talk like that. But what it did was to awaken a stronger social advocacy urge in me. I understood the role I could play here. And I decided that this truly, truly was a feast for our times, addressing issues of hunger, which was finally entering the mainstream media at that time, as well as migration. <clears throat> Given that this tradition was meant to feed the poor and welcome the stranger. So activist scholarship is primarily what I do today, especially in my work with the Watts Towers. And if you've never visited it, it's an extraordinary place and you must, but especially if you too are an Italian immigrant. I brought together two realities, the St. Joseph's Table and the Watts Towers, actually merging them in March of 2011 and I'll tell you how. <clears throat> it formed the culmination of two international conferences I helped organize, one in Genova, Italy in 2009, and one at UCLA in 2010. When it was here at UCLA though, I added a 
citywide festival, including concerts, theater, exhibitions, and tours. My goal was to bring greater attention to this world monument for a scholarly, but also a general public, focusing on common ground for its many and sometimes not harmonious stakeholders. In fact, I called it the Watts Towers Common Ground Initiative. And you can read, these were some of the sponsors. And you can read all about this in our four, 2014 Fordham University Press publication. I thought, what better way to demonstrate that idea of commonality and goodwill than to sit around an open table? What better way to address the real needs of those living around the Watts Towers than by providing food for the community of Watts? We worked hard to make something beautiful, feed hungry bodies and souls through art, and to demonstrate hospitality. So I coordinated a table in partnership with Rosie Lee Hooks, who is the director of the Watts Towers Community Arts Center, along with artists and Watts residents, Los Angeles Italians, including the Italian consul, Nicola Faganello, and the Italian Academy of Cuisine. We also asked Evan Kleinman and her KCRW Good Food radio audience to help us. And Evan made, you know, just a huge pot of pasta e fagioli and other things as well. And we included UCLA uh, Italian students and friends and, of course, always family. We made a table in Watts where there is no visible Italian community, but where there is great need with many recently arrived migrants and a growing number of homeless, as is the case all over LA. And I was doing this in the spirit of Virginia and Sam, who had done the same at St. Joseph's Church in East Los Angeles in 1989. So before showing you our St. Joseph's table in Watts, I must first say, I'll say only a few words about the Watts Towers because the full story would require another lecture. Here is Sabato known as Sam Rodia, the extraordinary Italian immigrant and visionary artist from the Campania region of Italy who built his towers in Watts. And he named them in Spanish, Nuestro Pueblo, our town, our people. He said that he wanted to make something big, something they never got him in the world. And he sure did. He did this alone over the span of 33 years from 1921 to 1954, creating a complex of mosaic structures out of found objects, shells, glass, ceramic shards, and anything he could find that he thought was beautiful. And here are some details of the Watts Towers. His initials, SR, and the so-called ship of Marco Polo. He too was a marginalized immigrant in a marginalized place. And I think he was trying to create a place of belonging for himself, as all newcomers wish to do, and a welcoming place for all those around him. With this gift to the community, he wanted to draw the people together, not around food, but around an artistic thing of beauty love and celebration. In fact, he filled it with hearts. He was inviting everyone to partake. Despite this, the city, which did not understand nor appreciate this pile of junk, as the building inspector called it, threatened to demolish them back in the 1950s. 
it took an international campaign and citizen action to stop them from destroying the Watts Towers. St. Joseph's Table in Watts. The parish in Watts we chose for our table itself reflected a community in transition with its mix of Latino and African-Americans. By the way, many of uh, those African-Americans at the church, I learned, were from Louisiana. And as we know, in New Orleans, at least, St. Joseph's were made, St. Joseph's tables were made by them as well. And the church was keenly aware of the need to integrate communities. And it commissioned a long mural in the parking lot created by Miguel Ramirez to reflect both communities. This altar we created, this is the altar we created with the baskets of fruit and vegetables at the base of it. I learned to make these breads, experimenting uh, with recipes in my own kitchen with family and friends, such as Nancy Romero. Here are some of the breads. And we also made several references to the Watts Towers on the altar itself, such as Charles Dixon's miniature model of the towers and Nuestro Pueblo in bread made by my daughters. And in our reenactment of the saints, um, the church chose actual immigrant members of the parish. The pageant took place on the Friday evening of a three day event and they spontaneously added musical accompaniment and followed the saints to the, main, to the main doors of the church. I think, and I think I can say this for Rosie and for me, the most poignant moment of the three-day event was when we on the inside of the church opened the main doors with these words, welcome to this house. On the last day, Sunday midday, we fed about 500 parishioners in shifts under a tent because it was raining and it never rains in LA, but it rained that day. And we even gathered about $3,000 for local food banks in Watts. Begging for food and shelter on the streets of Watts is a very real life daily drama. The homeless are right outside the church's doors. We were merely amplifying what the church was already doing for the community with its own food pantry. But I wanted to focus on the altar while almost eliminating the abundant table. Instead, I set a more humble Italian style dinner table as an immigrant might have prepared it closer to the main altar of the church and why did I do this? To underscore the sacred nature of the common dinner table itself. That is the more domestic version of the Christian Eucharist. I placed homemade loaves of bread and a flask of red wine on a checkered tablecloth with small wine glasses. These were all from my home and reminiscent of my immigrant family table. I literally wanted to bring this message home, especially perhaps for my fellow Italians, as I do with this presentation here at the Italian American Museum. My conclusions. Why should we continue to make St. Joseph's tables even in communities not our own? Well, let's turn the clock back, way back. Sicily, the largest island in the Mediterranean and at its crossroads, from ancient times has been inhabited by Phoenicians, Arabs, Normans, that is Norman, Northern Europeans. And Sicily, therefore, is no stranger to strangers. 
wayfaring Mediterranean peoples understood the ideal and the absolute necessity of practicing hospitality. Lodging the traveler and feeding the stranger were key values through their world from ancient to modern times. Think of the Christian saints tales of St. Christopher or St. Martin, which illustrate how in assisting the stranger, one may actually be welcoming the divine disguised in human form. In the pre-Christian world, they spoke instead about entertaining angels unawares. There is a spark of the divine in each of us, these tales seem to demonstrate, and hospitality is a sacred duty. Today instead, hospitality seems sometimes harder to come by as we witness the horrific plight of desperate irregular migrants, refugees, crossing deserts on foot or waters on rickety boats, trying to find refuge wherever they can, but often meeting a tragic end in what has become the sea of death. Despite universal human understanding and international laws stating that hospitality for refugees is a human right as well as just plain decent, I would add. We seem to be in deep moral and political crisis as we turn them away, build walls and stoke fear and hate of the other. Not realizing of course, that if today we extend hospitality, we may be hoping to receive it tomorrow as we randomly rise and fall on the wheel of fortune throughout history. And Sicilians have also been those reviled migrants themselves, once among the poorest of the poor, among the most feared, shunned, and isolated of Italian immigrants. Like so many other exploited and poor Italians, they too searched for that place where they would never go hungry again, that is America. Immigrants must not forget their own pasts, especially their own politically and economically motivated mass migrations, beginning with the very unification of Italy in the 1860s. I say that nations of migrants such as this one, America, has have no business victimizing economic and political refugees and preying on fears as though one of the richest places on earth did not have enough wealth or space to welcome them. We know our generation's long migration history and traumas of displacement. I know I do, both as a scholar of migration and as an immigrant myself, first to Canada and then to the US. Here I'm the infant in this passport picture with my mother and my sisters. I see the suffering of those like us and I, for one, have fully embraced an ethnology of compassion, taking to heart the words my father always said, fa bene e riscordatelo, do good and forget it. Sicilians clung hard to their cultural roots wherever they settled around the world and reenacted this tradition of hospitality in their homes and then shared it with others. And even though the poor are no longer Sicilians nor Italians, for the most part, I hope that the next generation, Sicilians and others, will hold on to the best of these culturally and spiritually rich traditions. Let's continue to display our keen sense of abundance for which Italians are famous. It's our mantra, abundanza, and let us teach others how to create it. Let's not operate from a scarcity mentality because the poor, the homeless, and the food insecure are growing every day, even more dramatically during the pandemic and where you'd least expect it. Food banks can barely keep up. But how can this be, I ask myself? We are one of the richest places on earth and in California, where we actually grow food for the entire nation. Something is profoundly wrong and we know it. 
So while the St. Joseph table cannot solve enormous problems such as food justice and immigration reform, it can draw attention to them. This custom demonstrates how traditional cultures have dealt with scarcity, with humanity, beauty, and devotion. But it is not enough. We need advocates for greater equity on all fronts to make change actually happen. Every day we are challenged to reassert the common, the concept of a common good back into our local, national, and international political discourse. We must feed the poor and we must welcome the stranger. It is the right thing to do, in my opinion. Here ends the uh, lecture. And here I have some of the writing that I have done on the St. Joseph's table in the last decade or so. But currently I am working uh, on a research project for a forthcoming volume on the cult of St. Joseph, which will be edited by Leonard Primiano and Joseph Shora. And I'm trying to understand the tradition's evolving meanings for the next generations. I have begun by interviewing Councilman Joseph Buscaino, a great devotee of the St. Joseph tradition in San Pedro, and Cal State Long Beach student Alexandra Antelos in COVID style uh, Zoom research. Uh, if you are interested in participating in this study, and of course you don't have to share my uh, political views, uh, please contact me at this email address. And I want to leave you with one last question. What will your children know of this tradition when they are all grown up? Thank you. That's it. Now we may have some questions. We shall be happy to uh, answer. So much, Try to uh, we really appreciate uh, you sharing your, your wealth of knowledge with us. Um, now, before we get into some of the audience questions, I wanted to share with you that um, one of the images used in your per, um, presentation of the participants of the uh, in the Tupa Tupa procession at St. Peter's Italian Church in Los Angeles uh, is actually, well, the, the one who was um, playing the role of the Madonna uh, is actually yes. our former intern. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's wonderful. What's her name? That was uh, taken obviously many years ago. She's now a graduate yes. student at USC, um, cool. but her family is still very active in the church. And it was just, uh, it was great to um, to see her there, so. <laughs> great, what was her name? What's her name? Uh, Marisa Spinella. Terrific. Yes, yes. Terrific, terrific. So we'd like to um, share a few uh, or pose a few questions from the audience. And we received some really great ones. So um, first we'd like to um, ask, um, can you explain the symbolism of bread on the table altars and why it's such an important focal point? Okay, so the minimal table has to have uh, these large breads um, on, the, on the altar. And of course we know the importance of bread in the Christian rite. It is the embodiment of the divine, of the, the, the body of Christ. But it's important to also remember that um, it is the core of Italian uh, food culture. We are a bread culture, at least in the center south, and um, it was the basic food. In fact, uh, companatico, the term companatico suggests that bread is the mainstay and everything else, vegetables, cheese, olives, accompany the bread. Uh, it is the basic food. It is sacred food. It is also what kept the masses this side of starvation. So miseria di pane, bread misery, uh, was when you couldn't even get that basic food. And we also remember that companions, companions with bread, are people who share, friends who share uh, the meal together. So bread is very important. It is never wasted. It is not dropped and it is reused in uh, peasant cuisine in every way you can imagine. It is sacred. 
Is it is it fair to say that bread on the tables is kind of a symbol that hunger has been exercised, which uh, you know, uh, which is kind of at the heart of the Saint J Joseph's Table tradition as well? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I think the Saint Joseph's Table has many layered meanings, but one of them is remember this was a held a mid Lenten season when the stores of food were very low. And so what you did was you redistributed what the community had and shared it. You may have little, but then there are the first fruits that start to appear. And you know you have faith in the springtime that you know spring and food will return. So uh, shafts of wheat on the tables, we often have shafts of wheat and we have the first little tender grass uh, growing. So yes, it is a way to exercise uh, hunger, the fear of hunger. I mean, Italians may have vanquished hunger, but they still deep in their bones with many of their food traditions, fear hunger, fear future hunger. It's why they hoard food in cantinas. That's another topic. That's one that I really uh, feel very strongly about, you know. Cucana is that, you know, really remains seared in the consciousnesses of uh, so many people. And um, Absolutely. You, know, you touched upon abondanza. We could dedicate a whole, a whole another conversation Absolutely. to that. Yeah. Um, so the, another question is, um, in your essay on St. Joseph's Tables, you describe how the veneration of St. Joseph in the early Catholic Church served as a counterbalance for the far more ancient veneration of the Madonna or the feminine divine. Can you explain more? Okay, so in the book by Gian, Lo, uh, Gian Lombardo, uh, a scholar, woman scholar from uh, Sicily from Palermo, I believe, she talks about the various stratifications of tradition in the St. Joseph table as we see it. So below the surface or um, next to it, we have the Christian culture of bread and charity and all of that, but we also have uh, the abundance of nature. Uh, many fertility rites use the same sorts of displays lots of fruit we have cornucopias of fruits and vegetables and in some parts of italy uh, some parts of sicily uh, they don't have tables but they'll have bonfires which are typical fertility right sorts of spring uh, rituals and uh, these so-called giardini di, uh, di adone the gardens of adonis uh, on the table so sprouted first grains and we see those actually on and they ha it happens about the same time the iranian uh, tradition of nowruz and they you know same kinds of things you know symbolic items on the table that suggest renewal fertility springtime so we have that on the definitely have that on the saint joseph's tables mm -hmm. as well and do you feel that in some ways the um the uh St. Joseph becoming a focal point, St. Joseph kind of becoming the, the, the um, I want to say the motherly father. Yes, kind of right. took the place of the virgin or took a little bit less focus. Well, here's a little bit of the history of that. The cult of St. Joseph comes to us from uh, Spain uh, and Toledo. And if you want to learn more about this heritage, the Hispanic background of this cult of St. Joseph, uh, and the church insisting on this patriarchal, uh, the father uh, of the holy family, uh, almost displacing the importance, which is much more ancient, of the Madonna, the female divine. Uh, read um, Charlene Villasenor Black's book on the cult of Saint Joseph. She is an art historian uh, at UCLA and uh, she, um, when we gave the lecture, when we did the table at Watts, we also had an intercultural uh, lecture series. Uh, and she spoke about San Jose, and I spoke about St. Joseph. And so that will give you all the details on how the church focused on the working man, the father of the family. And in some instances, outrageously, I mean, if you look at the imagery of St. Joseph, he is holding the baby just as though it were the Madonna. So here he is, a 
a mothering father, so to speak, and a working man. So, yeah. <laughs> it is a, it's a great work. In fact, it was, uh, you know, your essay and uh, her work were um, some of the, the sources that uh, were essential when we were putting together the exhibition. Oh, good. Glad to hear it. And that was done in California Italian Studies, and it's available to anyone. It's free access. Uh, and it was um, edited by Claudio Fogu, uh, my colleague, and Lucia Re. And um, it's, it's about Italian Californians. Okay, another question. Uh, St. Joseph is widely celebrated among African-American communities in and around New Orleans uh, and elsewhere in Louisiana. Can you explain how this came to be? Well, you know, one of the largest community of Italians in Louisiana were Sicilians. And uh, part, of the, part of that reason was that they came to uh, take the place of African, once they were freed, African slaves on the plantations. It's a really fascinating story. And um, a lot has been written about that. We had an, a program at the Italian Cultural Institute just this past year, a new book on Italians in New Orleans. And um, you know, it talks about this connubium uh, and the Sicilian community in New Orleans was very close to the African-American community until the KKK and the pressure for Sicilians to choose your side. You know, are you whites or are you not whites? And so many did choose the side of privilege, you know, and all of that. But uh, there was, uh, you know, they inhabited many of the same neighborhoods. And I think they shared with uh, friends and neighbors, this tradition. And because of the nature of uh, African-American spiritualist uh, churches that were very syncretic, were very open to bringing in, you know, uh, uh, in addition to practices of Vodun and their own deities, uh, Christian saints. And it's interesting how in uh, New Orleans, the marriage of the St. Joseph tradition with Mardi Gras was particularly uh, strong with the costuming. They'd have ball, St. Joseph's ball in costume, even though this was supposed to be a Lenten celebration, it was sort of a mid-Lenten um, reprieve from fasting. So there were all these festivities. And so, you know, we were supposed to have in March of this year, Finally, this great conference on St. Joseph's in New Orleans, and we all had bought our tickets and were ready to go. And that was organized by Leonard Premiano and Joseph Shora, and we had to cancel it. Uh, and it was a real pity because I would have loved to have seen uh, New Orleans, you know, tables. But instead, there is this volume that we're all uh, frantically doing research for and about to write and uh, get he's you know we've we're gathering these collection collection of essays on that on these topics yeah you know i don't know if i ever shared this with you this is just kind of a, a little aside but um my sicilian family came in through the port of uh new orleans oh. in the um, early 1890s and they worked in the um, on the plantations before uh, continuing west to Colorado and uh, really from what we can tell some of the you know animosity directed at Sicilians um, in the south at that time was one of the factors but um, anyway moving on to one of the Sicilians uh, really had it rough wherever they went Sicilians <laughs> had it rough wherever they went not only by the host societies but from other Italians right yeah. who were just just as foreign often yeah. Uh, you know, uh, each year I, um, I volunteer at the Feast of St. Joseph at St. Peter's Italian Church. And one of the most um, encouraging sites, in addition to, you know, the people of all walks of life sitting down together and breaking bread, um, is really the multi-generationality of the feast. You know, it's not uncommon to have three and sometimes even four generations in the kitchen. And so that leads us to um, our next question. Are younger women, and I guess we can include men in that as well, as are younger people prepared to take leadership roles as generations shift? Well, that's the question that remains to be seen. And that's part of the topic um, I'm researching. And I, you know, the person of that generation, Alexandra Antalos, uh, started, you know, uh, um, 
sharing concerns about that because this generation really has it rough. I mean, they are scrambling to make uh, futures for themselves in this pandemic economy and everything seems to be imploding and they have other concerns, you know, that they have to tend to. Will they have the time and the energy and the interest in the St. Joseph's table, um, you know, as we see it? But I'd like to also have us consider this question. You know, traditions are not always embalmed. They change through time. So how can we keep the spirit of this tradition and whatever works for this generation going forward? It may not be the tradition as we know it today. It will evolve. Uh, people will innovate. You know, how, we didn't have a, a table this year, right? So how did we instead feed the poor? and welcome the stranger. How do we get creative, uh, given our circumstances, to continue the core of the meaning of this tradition? So that's, I don't know, uh, Mariana, but I would suggest that because there are so many people, young people involved, that um, it will speak to them as they grow older, as they have children. I know that many of us start to really pay attention when we have our own kids. And we realize this is something I don't want to be, I don't want to lose, that this is really a continuation of the best part of our heritage, you know? We don't need to save it all. Some of it is junk, frankly, uh, and some of it, this is certainly not junk. Absolutely. So, And I, I think that going. was part of our intent in when, when we created this exhibition at the museum was to expose you know, very, um, only a small percentage of museum visitors are actually of Italian extraction. And so many yes. people are unfamiliar with the tradition, even among Italians, uh, mm -hmm. Italian Americans. Uh, you know, it, it, it started as a regional feast. Of course, many other um, uh, Italians from other regions beyond Sicily have since adopted it. Um, right. But there's, um, I think, so much that can be um, share that so, so there's so much about this feast that's very relevant to our time, Absolutely. regardless of who you are, where you're from, um, who doesn't like to come together and share a meal and um, ideally, you know, impart ideas and um, yeah. learn a little something from one another, which is kind of uh, something that's lacking in our times. You could well, that's the, that's the beauty of it. But I would like to also suggest that, you know, by having the exhibition, um, and by doing some of these things, we are demonstrating leadership. We are bringing to the attention of Italians and others something that is really compelling. And I think that this next generation is very interested in many of the progressive issues, uh, you know, that uh, maybe the older generation wasn't as interested in. This is one you can really get behind if you care about equity, if you care about those who don't have as much as we do, if you care about these, you know, the good side of our culture, Absolutely. you're going to want to stick with the St. Joseph's table Absolutely. and let some of the other nonsense go. I mean, some of the stuff that has to do with ethnic nationalism and with keeping the tribe together, not crossing boundaries, all that stuff that I just don't share and I don't care about. You know, I'm always interested in crossing boundaries and finding what we have in common with others. And Virginia was like that too. Mm -hmm. She was really um, always learning about other people's traditions. And, um, you know, she was really very, very open. And she said, you know, the more we learn about others, the more we learn that we're so much the same, Absolutely. you know? And I love that about Virginia. Now, our last question we received via Facebook, and I'm trying to still decipher it. Um, I think where, where they're trying to go is, um, you know, when I was a kid, one of my first memories, uh, or one of the first memories, I, let me preface that, where I understood that I was part of a group that was a little different than maybe some of my peers was when I attended a St. Joseph's table and that was held at Salvatore's restaurant. That's, and yeah. Um, yeah. and that time growing up here in Los Angeles, there were still St. Joseph's tables that were 
um, staged in people's homes, in restaurants, in yeah. secular places. Now, I think I understand the question correctly, um, which was, I would like to know how the Sicilian community considered making the tables outside of the ritualistic religious traditional settings. I okay. think I understand it correctly. And if I don't, I apologize. <laughs> Fine. Well, you know, this whole issue between private and public tables is a very interesting one. And in Sicily and in Italy, of course, the, that boundary is quite blurred. Uh, it, you know, you'd open up your, ta uh, your house or the, you'd put that altar right outside your front door. And in the old ethnic neighborhoods, you can read Charles Speroni, who wrote about St. Joseph's tables in the 1940s. And he was talking about... Um, uh, Los Angeles and how it was very much like that. So in an entire neighborhood, there were many people doing these tables and you mm -hmm. would just hop from one uh, house to the next and make the rounds uh, and, you know, maybe even outdoors. Uh, so you, what you can do in a neighborhood that's fairly homogenous and then, of course, also knock on the doors when you're doing the pageant, which you can't really do in a multi-ethnic diverse, they don't know what you're talking about, what you're doing. So at the church, they will literally go around the church. But uh, I think uh, one of the reasons it became so uh, prevalent in uh, Catholic churches with an Italian presence is through the Italian Catholic Federation. And Father Pisano, as I understand it, had quite a hand in that. And so he brought this, I mean, people still make devotional tables. I have no idea how many but most of them today are in public places. And that's uh, thanks to the Sicilian uh, community, but also the Italian Catholic Federation. So that's part of the answer. Yes, absolutely. And, and uh, maybe uh, my, I just received a little message that my internet connection is unstable, but I hope uh -oh. everybody can still hear us. Um, you know, I, it would be a, a wonderful thing if we can, you know, once again, um, stage, you know, such uh, celebrations, such altars in our homes and, you know, open our, our, our homes up to strangers. Yes, I think that's very important. Um, very important to me, at least. Very good. Oh, yes, my, I, I think you my have a, a dog in the background. <laughs> he's probably doesn't want you to be on on camera anymore. No, no, he's uh, he's letting us know that someone is here. Well, thank you so much again for joining us tonight. Um, we uh, wish we could be doing this in person right now, certainly, but um, it's it's great to to see you and and um, you know your your work in the community is is tremendous and. Um, you're, you're truly a, you know, just a wonderful resource for so much uh, when it comes to um, Italian and Italian American traditions, folklore, oral history. Um, so I, I hope you will join us again um, at a future program at the museum. If not on St. Joseph's Tables, uh, there's, uh, sure. you know, many, many other topics. Absolutely. Topic. Call anytime and thank you again, Mariana, for this invitation and good luck with the museum and all the work that you do. Thank you very much. Now, I want to also um, encourage um, those of us who are joining to us tonight to join the IMLA on September 30th, when our guest will be Italian-American lawyer, teacher, playwright, and author, Neil Thomas Proto, who will be leading a, us um, in a presentation um, that commemorates the Sacco and Vanzetti trial. Um, it will explore the enduring meaning of the Sacco and Vanzetti case, within the American experience. So um, again, please tune in. We'll be sharing more information about this um, virtual event uh, via social media and our newsletter. Um, thank you again for, for joining us tonight. Have a good evening, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.